post-apocalyptic America, a troupe of traveling actors tries to keep the great art of the past alive while searching for the remnants of civilization in Station Eleven. That's the book I'm reviewing on this episode of SFF 180. Hello everybody, Thomas here. Once again, as usual, thank you so much for joining me. Now, the hackneyed approach to the post-apocalyptic story is uh, usually a nightmarish and desperate tale, uh, typically set right in the immediate aftermath of civilization's fall. You know, we've seen all of these tropes, right? We've got the dregs of humanity struggling uh, through their uh, miserable existence. They're dressed in rags. They're usually killing each other savagely over food and, and whatever dwindling resources are left to them. Inevitably, you usually see the survivors you know, split off into two symbolic camps. You've got uh, those representing hope and goodness over here, right? And then you've got the other, typically led by some sort of crazed, opportunistic, a power-hungry warlord, and he threatens evil and destruction all upon everybody else. So ingrained is this formula in the minds of audiences that many critics who really ought to know better have actually taken Emily St. John Mandel to task for not turning Station Eleven into merely the latest post-apocalypse horror story uh, to mimic The Stand, or The Road, or uh, you know, The Postman. Most of the post-collapse scenes in Station Eleven are, are set around two decades after the event that ends it all for us. Uh, a captain trips like Mutant Super Plague uh, with a really prosaic name of the Georgia Flu. Doesn't sound all that bad, but if it hits you, it kills you within hours. Now, Mandel uses this doom scenario to spin a story about the connectedness that humanity has, that all of us have to one another, and about the redemptive power and therapeutic necessity of art in all of our lives. The story begins in gripping fashion on a cold, rainy night in a Toronto theater, when a performance of King Lear is uh, rather cruelly cut short when its leading man, an aging movie idol named Arthur Leander, kills over and dies of a heart attack on stage. As the crowds shuffle out, no one is aware that right at that very moment, passengers from a recently arrived overseas plane are being wheeled into hospital emergency rooms where some of them are already dying. Once all of this establishment is out of the way, and Mandel handles all of it with an absolutely expert hand at slow burn suspense, the novel then proceeds through what is known in Hollywood screenwriting terms as a mosaic narrative. We bounce back and forth through time, uh, covering multiple viewpoint characters' lives prior to and long after the disaster. A chief protagonist is Kirsten Ramond, whom we first meet in the prologue as uh, a young eight-year-old actress with a very small, non-speaking part in that ill-fated King Lear performance, and whom we also learn befriended Arthur, the lead actor, during the rehearsal period of that play when Arthur gave her a couple of comic books titled Station Eleven, uh, which had been drawn by one of his many ex-wives. Years later, in her early 20s, Kirsten now roams the post-collapse Great Lakes region as part of the Traveling Symphony, a group of actors and musicians who go from settlement to settlement to putting on Shakespeare plays and concerts in exchange for food and whatever else. In the pre-collapse scenes, we learn mostly of the life of Arthur Leander and his wife Miranda, who hid from the jet-set lifestyle of uh, Hollywood by immersing herself in her art. In Miranda's comics, Station Eleven houses Earth's last survivors. It's a moon-sized space station floating out there amongst the universe, and it's run by a man named Dr. Eleven, who is having a bit of a rift between uh, a group of rebels who live under the oceans of the moon and who simply want to go back home. Now, Mandel isn't exactly subtle when she starts drawing a parallel between the story of Miranda's comics and the lives of uh, the people who are trying to make their way through the post collapse society, but she writes it all with such storytelling grace that it, it actually draws you in and it doesn't put you off as a reader. For readers looking for some harrowing passages, there's a sequence late in the novel set in an abandoned airport in Michigan that has become home to several hundred people as well as a museum of pre-collapse civilization where things like smartphones and laptops are on display. Mandel most effectively conveys the horror of the collapse not through cliched scenes of human depravity, but through the subtle touch of the moment-by-moment -moment loss of conveniences that we've all become accustomed to. Like, first the TV stations go off the air, and then the phones stop working, and then the internet goes out, and then lights go off after a while, and then after a while there's no plumbing, and you can't flush toilets. Then after a few years have passed, 
gasoline has all gone stale, so there are no more cars that you can drive. Uh, a particularly haunting moment uh, in the airport sequence has survivors at the airport watching the final takeoff of what's going to be the last plane they will ever see aloft. This was a day-to-day -day occurrence, and now suddenly, all at once, it's never going to happen again. That is where this book really brings home to the reader in a very personal way what a collapse like this would mean. Think of all of the things you've done today, everything you're doing right now that you take for granted, even watching this YouTube video. Imagine suddenly none of that is ever available to you ever again. It's just gone. Now, it may be the case that Station Eleven is a cozy catastrophe, right? Now, that's a, that's a phrase I'm stealing from uh, J.G. Ballard, who coined it uh, because he was snarking on a, a writer named John Wyndham at the time. But uh, maybe it doesn't pay enough close attention to those first few terrifying years of, you know, white-knuckle survival. But in the end, it's clear that the story Emily St. John Mandel wanted to tell here was an optimistic one of people who were seeking to rebuild their world by remembering and striving to preserve everything that was good about the old one. The result is that Station Eleven becomes an end-of-the-world saga that ends on a sense of hope that, instead of feeling contrived and obligatory, actually feels legitimately and gratefully earned. And that is all I've got time for on this episode of SFF 180. Everybody, thank you so much for joining me. Once again, remember the most important thing, these are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please leave a like, share this video far and wide with your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. That is how this channel grows. And until I see all of you guys next time, happy reading.